Greetings, church. As we continue to walk our way through Lent in preparation for Easter, we are served by our lectionary a number of classic Lenten texts, and this is one of them, John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. The text before us tells us something about the essential nature of Jesus's mission. What was he all about? Why did he come to the earth in the first place? The text also tells us something of the essential nature of Christian discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a Christian? If you want to be a Christian, uh, what is required of you? The text tells us that. This happened, the text here, happened immediately after the triumphal entry of Jesus, the, the event that we celebrate on Palm Sunday. Jesus riding into the city with thousands of people, taking off their coats, laying the coats down in front of Jesus, waving palm branches, singing Hosanna uh, to the king. This, this was their king entering the city to finally take charge and crush the Roman oppressors. Jesus's popularity was growing just like the population of Jerusalem was also growing because this was the Feast of pa Passover. Jews everywhere coming to their capital city to re-enter and relive and re-experience and re-celebrate the greatest event in Jewish history, the Passover, the Exodus, where God sent Moses to confront Pharaoh and command, commanded him to let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh kept saying, no, I'm not gonna let your people go. And one by one, God came with his judgment signs upon the nation of Egypt. But they were incalcitrant. And finally, the 10th sign came to the nation. The death angel itself was going to pass over Egypt, destroying the firstborn son of every household. But God said to the Israelite families, your firstborn son doesn't have to die. However, you will need a substitute. The head of every household must take a perfect spotless lamb and you must kill that lamb. The lamb will be the vicarious atonement for your sons and for yourselves. You must drain the blood uh, into a basin and then apply the blood of that lamb to the outside of your house. And when the death angel passes over every house, where he sees the blood applied, he will pass over you and you will be spared the judgment of God. Also, inside the house where the blood has been applied, you shall eat the lamb. Every member of your family will eat the sacrifice. Hmm. Do you see any sacramental overtones there? So this is what everybody's thinking about and celebrating during this particular feast. Now, it says there were some Greeks who came to Jerusalem to also worship during the feast. These were non-Jewish people. They were Gentiles. They were like us. But they were interested in the Hebrew God. They were interested in his story, in his scriptures, and many of them were becoming what we call Jewish converts or Jewish proselytes. They came to some of Jesus' disciples and they made a simple, noble, beautiful request. They said, we would like to see Jesus. Or putting it another way, could you uh, introduce us to Jesus? Could you schedule a planned meeting between us and Jesus? We would like to talk to Jesus ourselves, one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, that everybody would have the same desire as these Greeks, whoever they were. So this request was relayed from the Lord's disciples to the Lord, but in typical Jesus cryptic fashion, Jesus chose not to meet with the Greeks. Rather, he used the question to launch into a discourse about his death. 
Verse 23, Jesus basically says, this is not the hour for me to be talking to Greeks or to anybody else for that matter who wants a meeting with me. It's not that it's wrong, but that's not my hour. This is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. Hmm. In other words, this is the hour for the Son of Man to show the entire world the full extent of my deity that I have been sent from the Father and I am just like the Father. But the shock came in what Jesus said next. He likened his purpose and his um, glorifying God to being a simple grain of wheat that unless it falls to the ground and dies and is buried, remains just a singular grain of wheat. But if it dies, he said, it will bring forth much fruit. It will bring forth many seeds from a single seed that dies. He was talking about himself as the seed. He was the seed who was going to die. Now, how did Jesus feel about this? The text tells us he wasn't cavalier at all. It says in verse 27 that this troubled Jesus. He says, now is my heart troubled. On another occasion, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death. Remember, Jesus prayed in the garden, if there's another way for us to accomplish all this, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then Jesus says in our text, how should I pray? Should I say, Lord, deliver me from this hour? And then he answers his own question. He says, no, for this very hour I have come. So Jesus makes it really clear in this text that he came into the world to die, but not just to die a normal death, like you and I hope to die of old age. No. Jesus would die in the prime of life via the most hideous, shameful, excruciating public death ever invented, Roman crucifixion. He talks about that kind of death in this very text when he says, for if I be lifted up from the earth. Now, those of us listening to this, I mean, if, if you were listening to this for the very first time and you were just learning about Jesus, your, your question would be, really? Are you kidding me? You were born into this world as God, the eternal son, for the purpose of dying on a Roman cross? And then the next question would be, what in the world did your death accomplish? And it's almost as if Jesus, recognizing what people were thinking, answered the question. He said, what will my death accomplish? Number one, it will glorify my Father. Verse 28, through my death, I will reveal to the world the self-sacrificing nature of my Father. This is how much he loves the world, even the world that is in opposition to him. Secondly, my death will bring judgment to the world. By world, Jesus doesn't mean all the people in the world. He means the evil, corrupt world system that we are all living in. He says, now is the time for judgment to this world. This present world system has always been bent on advancing its own kingdom through power, through crushing its enemies, through political power and military power. Wherever it sees opposition, it sets out to destroy it, to crush it. This was the way of Rome. This is the way of most nation states today. This is what we're seeing on the news. In the death of of Jesus, uh, the world system is judged in light of who God is because in the death of Jesus, we see the, the way forward is through the self-sacrificing love of God and others for other people. That's the way the kingdom moves forward when we lay our lives down 
for each other and serve one another in self-sacrificing love. Also, when Jesus talks about his death being associated with judgment, he's also talking about how when he chose to lay down his life in sacrifice for us on the cross, he took all of the sins of Adam's sinful race and he judged them. Instead of God judging us and punishing us for our sins, something that we deserve, Jesus stepped in and said, I will take your sins in my own body on the cross and I will pay sin's penalty for you. This is what we call the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, that his death was in your place, that you and I deserve to die and be judged for our sins, but Jesus paid the price on the cross. Thirdly, what did the death of Jesus accomplish? The prince of this world would be driven out, verse 31. Hmm. Another time, Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. He came, he came to set the captives free. Through his own death, Jesus would conquer death and thus destroy him, the devil, who held us as a slave in our fear of death. That's what the book of Hebrews tells us. I love this text. For he forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took those sins away, nailing them to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Yes, through his own death, Jesus not only tasted death on behalf of every person, but he destroyed the works of the devil in holding us in fear of death. And number four, what did Jesus' death accomplish? Through being lifted up from the earth on a cross, Jesus said, verse 33, I will draw all people to myself. This is interesting language. If I be lifted up from the earth, what was Jesus meaning? I think he meant, if I be lifted up from the earth in crucifixion and I die on your behalf, if I be lifted up from the earth in resurrection and I come out of the ground as the head of a brand new race, as I come out of the ground as the first fruits of the resurrection, never to die again, and as I be lifted up in the ascension uh, where I sit down at the right hand of God and I am given uh, the keys to the kingdom. I rule over every principality and power from that throne at the right hand of God. If I be lifted up in crucifixion, in resurrection, and in glorious ascension, don't worry. I will draw all people groups to myself. So those Greeks who want to see me, they will. They will see me. Just not today. Those Greeks will see me through a spirit-filled church after the day of Pentecost. Those Greeks will also see me through the gospel as it is being preached. And those Greeks will meet me through my disciples, all of whom will follow me in this world, verse 26. And how will you recognize these disciples? How will these Gentile people recognize my followers? They will love me more than they love their own lives. They will love me more than they love their own families, their own children. They will love me more than anything else. They too will be grains of wheat. They will fall to the ground and die in baptism. And they will be raised up, filled with the Spirit, to bear my love and my witness to the world. Those Greeks who want to see me, Oh, they'll see me.